But to return to Monterey, the houses here, as everywhere else in California, are of one story, built of clay made into large bricks, about a foot and a half square and three or four inches thick, and hardened in the sun. These are cemented together by mortar of the same material, and the whole are of a common dirt color. The floors are generally of earth, the windows grated and without glass, and the doors, which are seldom shut, open directly into the common room, there being no entries. Some of the more wealthy inhabitants have glass to their windows and board floors, and in Monterey, nearly all the houses are plastered on the outside. The better houses, too, have red tiles upon the roofs. The common ones have two or three rooms which open into each other and are furnished with a bed or two, a few chairs and tables, a looking glass, a crucifix of some material or other, and small daubs of paintings enclosed in glass and representing some miracle or martyrdom. They have no chimneys or fireplaces in the houses, the climate being such as to make a fire unnecessary, and all their cooking is done in a small cookhouse separated from the house. The Indians, as I have said before, do all the hard work, two or three being attached to each house, and the poorest persons are able to keep one, at least, for they have only to feed them and give them a small piece of coarse cloth and a belt for the males, and a coarse gown without shoes or stockings for the females. In Monterey, there are a number of English and Americans, English or Ingles, all are called who speak the English language, who have married Californians, become united to the Catholic Church, and acquired considerable property. Having more industry, frugality, and enterprise than the natives, they soon get nearly all the trade into their hands. They usually keep shops in which they retail the goods purchased in larger quantities from our vessels, and also send a good deal into the interior, taking hides and pay, which they again barter with our vessels. In every town on the coast, there are foreigners engaged in this kind of trade, while I recollect but two shops kept by natives. The people are generally suspicious of foreigners, and they would not be allowed to remain were it not that they become good Catholics, and by marrying natives and bringing up their children as Catholics and Mexicans, and not teaching them the English language, they, quite, they quiet suspicion, and even become popular and leading men. The chief Alcalds in Monterey and Santa Barbara were both Yankees by birth. The men in Monterey appeared to me to be always on horseback. Horses are as abundant here as dogs and chickens were in Juan Fernandez. There are no stables to keep them in, but they are allowed to run wild and graze wherever they please, being branded and having long leather ropes called lassos attached to their necks and dragging along behind them, by which they can be easily taken. The men usually catch one in the morning, throw a saddle and bridle upon him and use him for the day and let him go at night, catching another the next day. When they go on long journeys, they ride on. They ride one horse down and catch another, throw the saddle and bridle upon him, and after riding him down, take a third, and so on to the end of the journey. There are probably no better riders in the world. They get upon a horse when only four or five years old, their little legs not long enough to come halfway over his sides, and may almost be said to keep on him until they have grown to him. The stirrups are covered or boxed up in front to prevent their catching when riding through the woods, and the saddles are large and heavy strapped very tight upon the horse and have large pommels, or loggerheads, in front, round which the lasso was coiled when not in use. They can hardly go from one house to another without getting on a horse, there being generally several standing tied to the doorposts of the little cottages. When they wish to show their activity, they make no use of their stirrups in the mounting, but striking the horse, spring into the middle, spring into the saddle as he starts, and sticking their long spurs into him, go off on the full run. Their spurs are cruel things, having four or five rowels, 
each an inch in length, dull and rusty. God. The flanks of the horses are often sore from them. And I have seen men come in from chasing bullocks with their horses' hind legs and quarters covered with blood. They frequently give exhibitions of their horsemanship in races, bull baitings, etc. But as we were not ashore during any holy day, we saw nothing of it. Monterey is also a great place for cockfighting, gambling of all sorts, fandangos, and every kind of amusement and knavery. Trappers and hunters who occasionally arrive here from over the Rocky Mountains with their valuable skins and furs are often entertained with every sort of amusement and dissipation until they have wasted their time and their money and go back stripped of everything. Nothing but the character of the people prevents Monterey from becoming a great town. The soil is as rich as a man could wish, climate as good as any in the world, water abundant, and situations extremely beautiful. The harbor, too, is a good one, being subject only to one bad wind, the north, and though the holding ground is not the best, yet I heard of but one vessel's being driven ashore here. That was a Mexican brig, which went ashore a few months before our arrival and was a total wreck, all the crew but one being drowned. Yet this was from the carelessness or ignorance of the captain, who paid out all his small cable before he let go his other anchor. The ship Lagoda of Boston was there at the time and rode out the gale in safety without dragging it all or finding it necessary to strike her top gallant masts. The only vessel in port with us was the little Laureate. I frequently went on board her and became very well acquainted with her Sandwich Island crew. One of them could speak a little English, and from him I learned a good deal about them. They were well-formed and active, with black eyes, intelligent countenances, dark olive, or I should rather say, copper complexions and coarse black hair, but not woolly like the Negroes. They appeared to be talking continually. In the forecastle, there was a complete babble. Their language is extremely guttural and not pleasant at first, but improves as you hear it more and is said to have great capacity. They use a good deal of gesticulation and are exceedingly animated, saying with their might what their tongues find to say. They are complete water dogs, therefore very good in boating. It is for this reason that there are so many of them on the coast of California they being very good hands in the surf. They are also quick and active in the rigging and good hands in warm weather, but those who have been with them around Cape Horn and in high latitudes say that they are useless in cold weather. In their dress, they are precisely like our sailors. In addition to these islanders, the vessel had two English sailors who acted as boatswains over the islanders and took care of the rigging. One of them I shall always remember as the best specimen of the thoroughbred English sailor that I ever saw. He had been to sea from a boy, having served a regular apprenticeship of seven years, as all English sailors are obliged to do, and was then about four or five and twenty. He was tall, but you only perceived it when he was standing by the side of others, for the great breadth of his shoulders and chest made him appear but little above the middle height. His chest was as deep as it was wide, his arm like that of Hercules, and his hand, quote, the fist of a tar, every hair a rope yarn, end of quote. With all this, he had one of the pleasantest smiles I ever saw. His cheeks were of a handsome brown, his teeth brilliantly white, and his hair of a raven black, waved in loose curls all over his head and fine open forehead. In his eyes, he might have sold to a duchess at the price of diamonds for their brilliancy. As for their color, they were like the Irishman's pig, which would not stay to be counted. Every change of position and light seemed to give them a new hue. But their prevailing color was black, or nearly so. Take him with his well-varnished black tarpaulin stuck upon the back of his head, his long locks coming down almost into his eyes, his white duck trousers and shirt, blue jacket and black kerchief tied loosely around his neck, and he was a fine specimen of manly beauty. On his broad chest he had, on his broad chest he had stamped with India ink parting moments. a ship ready to sail, a boat on the beach, and a girl and her sailor lover taking their farewell. Underneath were printed the initials of his own name and two other letters standing for some name which he knew better than I did. This was very well done, having been executed by a man who made it his business to print with India ink for sailors at Hav. On one of his broad arms he had the crucifixion, and on the other the sign of the foul anchor. <laughs> he 
He was very fond of reading, and we lent him most of the books which we had in the forecastle, which he read and returned to us the next time we fell in with him. He had a good deal of information, and his captain said he was a perfect seaman, and worth his weight in gold on board a vessel. In fair weather and in foul, his strength must have been great, and he had the sight of a vulture. It is strange that one should be so minute in the description of an unknown, outcast sailor, whom one may never see again, and whom no one may care to hear about, but so it is. Some people we see under no remarkable circumstances, but whom, for some reason or other, we never forget. He called himself Bill Jackson. And I, know, and I know no one of all my accidental acquaintances to whom I would more gladly give a shake of the hand than to him. Whoever falls in with him will find a handsome, hearty fellow and a good shipmate. Sunday came again while we were at Monterey, but as before, it brought us no holy day. The people on shore dressed themselves and came off in greater numbers than ever, and we were employed all day in boating and breaking out cargo so that we had hardly time to eat. Our sidivant second mate, who was determined to get liberty if it was to be had, dressed himself in a long coat and black hat and polished his shoes and went aft and asked to go ashore. He could not have done a more imprudent thing, for he knew that no liberty would be given, and besides sailors, however they may be of having liberty granted them always go aft in their working clothes, to appear as though they had no reason to expect anything, and then wash, dress, and shave after they got their liberty. But this poor fellow was always getting into hot water, and if there was a wrong way of doing a thing, was sure to hit upon it. We looked to see him go aft, knowing pretty well what his reception would be. The captain was walking the quarter deck, smoking his morning cigar, and F went as far as the break of the deck, and there waited for him to notice him. The captain took two or three turns, and then walking directly up to him, surveyed him from head to foot, and lifting up his forefinger, said a word or two in a tone too low for us to hear, but which had a magical effect upon poor F. He walked forward, sprang into the forecastle, and in a moment more made his appearance in his common clothes and went quietly to work again. What the captain said to him, we never could get him to tell, but it certainly changed him outwardly and inwardly in a most surprising manner. <laughs>